Okay, so this is the final exam review video for the class. I'm actually going to show you a final exam that I have used in the past. And we're going to go through the questions. And this, just like, this is just like we did with the review video last time. Uh, I will show you the question. If you get it right, you move on to uh, the next one. If you get it wrong, you'll see me explaining what the answer should be. So let's go ahead and begin. So this first one says, social psychologists focus more on blank as a source of behaviors. Okay, so social, so this is the difference between personality and social psychology that we talked about. So personality means your personality. Personal dispositions means your personality. Social situations, that's what social psychologists focus on. Heuristics are shortcuts in decision-making. That's a heuristic. Social psychologists don't really focus on those. Cognitive psychologists do. Evolutionary theory, lots of different psychologists worry about evolutionary theory, not just social psychologists. The ABCs of psychology are blank behavior and blank. ABC, affect, behavior, and cognition. That's from the very beginning of class. Affect means feeling states. Behavior is behavior. Cognition means mental processing. Affect, behavior, cognition. Cognitive load happens because of the limited capacity of which one? All right. So capacity means how much you can put in there. Long-term memory has an unlimited capacity. You can put as much in there as you can fit. Sensory memory. That also has an unlimited capacity, just a limited duration. It's short-term memory, the stuff that we're thinking about right now, that's limited to seven plus or minus two chunks of information. Which of the following is an example of how motivated cognition influences thought and behavior? Okay, so motivated cognition influences thoughts and behaviors. So let's kind of go on how we think about these things. So the self-serving bias is a bias where we attribute positive outcomes to ourselves and negative outcomes to other things, all right? So that's a form of attribution. Normally we don't think about that particularly as a form of motivated cognition, however, it is about how we are motivated to think well of ourselves. So it is actually an example of motivated cognition. The cocktail party effect, that's when you were talking to somebody and then suddenly you hear your name and you're paying attention to that instead. That is definitely motivated cognition. Comparative cognition, that's when we compare humans to non-human species. And that's nothing to do with motivated cognition. The confirmation bias, is when we make information fit with what we already believe to be true or correct. That one is an example of how motivated cognition influences thought. Your capacity in your short-term memory is blank plus or minus two pieces of information. We just talked about this one when we were talking about um, uh, cognitive load. So short-term memory can have seven, and in this case, you can either put the number seven, or I think you can type out seven, but seven plus or minus two pieces of information uh, in your short-term memory. Availability heuristic is most related to which one of these? The availability heuristic is something that is available in your brain, all right? So the availability heuristic, is it related to cognitive dissonance? Well, not really, because that's about behavior in conflict with a belief about myself, so not really. Biosocial theory, that's the evolutionary theory, not really anything to do with it. Self-serving bias, that's when uh, I'm motivated to think, um, I make up an, an internal attribution when something good happens to me or an external attribution when something bad happens to me. That's not really about availability. Priming is making something more accessible or available in your brain, so that is the right answer. Self-perception theory is when we make a, when we discover our attitudes about ourselves by looking at our own behaviors. 
To be diagnosed with dysthymia, a person must experience their symptoms for at least two years. Dysthymia is persistent uh, depressive disorder. And you have to experience these um, symptoms for at least two years. Major depression is for two weeks. Which of the following would you operationalize in a study? Okay, operationalize means either to manipulate or to measure. Those are the two kinds of operationalizations. An independent variable is the variable that causes a change in the dependent variable. So for example, in an experiment, the thing that you, the researcher, change in the participants is the independent variable. It's the thing that you manipulate. So if you manipulate it, then it has to be an operationalization. The dependent variable is something that you measure. You always measure it. And since it's a measurement, it's also an operationalization. External validity. It's not a measurement or a manipulation. So the answers are independent variable and dependent variable. Sheridan and King, uh, they're the ones who did the real shocks on the puppies. Okay, people were worried that perhaps in Milgram's experiment, no, it wasn't an experiment, Milgram's study, um, they people were just responding because they, they knew what they were supposed to respond to. Um, they didn't really, you know, want to shock the people, and they really didn't think they were shocking the people. They thought they were doing it because they knew what the researchers wanted them to do, and that is a demand characteristic. Rosenthal effect is when the researchers unwittingly change the, um, the, uh, the results of what's going on in the participant, right? In this case, there, that wasn't happening. The placebo effect is when the when the uh, participants actually believe that the change is causing something else um, when it's not, and that's not what's going on here. The actual belief that happened was because of you know they actually believed they're shocking people. Um, demand characteristics is when um, people think that they're just going along with it to do whatever the researcher wants them to do. Individuals suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder may avoid people or places that increase anxiety levels. We can explain this using some basic terminology from behavioral psychology. For example, after someone has experienced a violent incident at a shopping mall, similar retail locations we've considered a UCR means unconditioned response, UCS means unconditioned stimulus, CS means conditioned stimulus, NS means neutral stimulus, CR means conditioned response. So in this particular case, let's say that somebody had um, was at a shopping mall and a violent incident happened. Okay, the violent incident would become would be the UCS because a violent inc inc uh, incident creates a fear response, the unconditioned response. So, violent stimulus creates fear. Unconditioned stimulus, the violent stimulus uh, incident creates fear, which is unconditioned response. The shopping mall should be a neutral stimulus at the beginning of this. It shouldn't have anything to do with it. it. Shouldn't have anything to do with it at all. But because it happened at the shopping mall, it might be associated with it. And the neutral stimulus becomes what's called a conditioned stimulus. And similar retail locations could be a conditioned stimulus that cause a conditioned response of fear. Many people have trouble getting their dog to walk on a leash without being pulled forward by the dog. I'm taking this course to suggest the dog finds walking pleasurable. So one fine, one way to modify uh, its behavior is to stop and take a five second timeout when it pulls forward on the leash, taking away the dog's ability to head towards it where it wants to go. You're suggesting the dog owner use blank to reduce the undesired behavior of pulling forward. All right, so we want to reduce a behavior. So automatically we know, we know that this is punishment. Okay, we know this is a punishment because we wanna reduce the undesired behavior. So in this case, what are we doing? We are taking away, we are taking away the dog's ability to head towards where it wants to go. We're taking away something. So we are punishing by taking away, that is negative punishment. Positive punishment would be adding something to stop a behavior, adding something like pain. Reinforcements have to be, uh, want the behavior to increase. And so positive would be adding something in order for the behavior to increase. Negative would be taking away something in order for the behavior to increase. 
Personality psychologists focus more on blank as a source of behaviors. So this was the opposite of the social psychology stuff we were talking about. Heuristics, social situations, personal dispositions, or evolutionary theory. Personal dispositions means the personality. That's what that means. So that's the right answer. Individuals suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. This is very similar, okay? But instead of looking at the last one, which was the, the retail locations are um, what the retail locations become, the fear response is, so let's make sure we're clear on this. Someone has experienced violence as a shaman, they may experience a fear response. What is that going to be? Well, look right here. When we talk about this, um, that makes the uh, experience of fear response. Fear response is uh, the initial fear response would be the unconditioned response, but it would also be a conditioned response later on. It can be both of these because it's not indicating whether it's before or after, right? Fear response is the unconditioned response and it's the conditioned response, it's both. The spinal cord is part of the, the brain and the spinal cord are part of the central nervous system. Section blank of this diagram is where you would find the neurotransmitters. Okay, neurotransmitters, all right, let's, let's go through this. A is the soma, B are the dendrites, these receive the signals. C is the axon hillock. This whole thing right here is D, that is the axon. These, the myelin sheets or Schwann cells as they're called, help the, um, help the signal go faster. F is the terminal and G is the terminal buttons. And that is where you would find the neurotransmitters. Section marked one, right back here in this diagram is the, one is the occipital lobe. Occipital lobe. And when you're doing these, make sure that you're spelling them right, right? So if you're ever curious, you say, gosh, did I spell that one right? I'm just gonna go look in occipital, oh, lip. yep, that's it, occipital lobe. I did spell it right, occipital lobe, good. One is occipital lobe has to do with vision, understanding vision. Two is the temporal lobe. Generally, we do that with language comprehension and production. Three is the parietal lobe. Parietal lobe, that's where we understand our sensory motor functions like sensations, et cetera. Four is the frontal lobe. That's where we process, um, do executive processing and uh, decision making. But one is the occipital lobe. The blank are separated when someone is a split brain patient. All right. So in this case, the blank are separated. All right, so what are separated? The corpus callosum is separated, right? So we know that the corpus callosum is split. But because of that, all of the lobes are split. All of the lobes, because you have lobes on both sides of your, uh, the cerebrum, right? So you have two hemispheres of the cerebrum, and they have all those lobes. All of those are separated when you have a split brain patient. Section mark four in the diagram. This is one we talked about before, but oh, it's not asking for frontal lobe now. It's asking for some other things. The Broca's area is located. Well, Broca's area has to do with speech production, language production. And that's on the temporal lobe of your left hemisphere. This is my left hemisphere right there. Well, that's not right. Executive functioning and reasoning. Oh, that's number four. Yep. Phineas Gage had a rod go through his brain. Yep, he did in the frontal lobe. The somatosensory cortex, mm, that's in the parietal lobe, parietal lobe. So the answer are these two. A split brain patient has, which one? Well, it definitely has a severed corpus callosum. And it also has no communication between the hemispheres of the cerebrum, we know that. Two amygdalas, no, amygdala is part of the midbrain. The hindbrain, mm, there's no hemispheres of the hindbrain. So these are the correct answers here. Which one of these is responsible for after images? All right, so our options are C, the lens. E, right here. Okay, that's the, uh, that, that just keeps the, the body together. I think it's the, um, 
I can't even remember what it's called, frankly, it doesn't matter because it's not the right answer. <laughs> H is all of this back part right here, the retina. And that's where the rods or cones are. And guess what? And that would be correct. Because after images are based off of fatiguing the cones. And H is all of the yellow, all of the yellow. That's all of the retina. Okay? And F, F is the ciliary muscles, none of that, none of that. And J, J is the blind spot. So correct answer is H, the retina, because that's where the rods and cones are. There's a special part of the retina called the fovea, which is part I, but it's, but it's still part of the retina. Which one of these is the extraocular muscles? Guess what? These are all things that are inside of the eye. Extraocular muscles are outside of the eye. None of these are the extraocular muscles. The post blank neuron is the one that receives signals from another neuron. Post synaptic. Remember, the synapse is the space between two neurons, and so it is uh, post synaptic. It's after the synapse, after the gap. Which of these involves top-down processing? Well, relative height is a uh, monocular depth cue that requires context. Top-down processing requires context to understand what's going on. So yeah, good continuation. Uh, that requires context too. That's a Gestalt principle. Familiar size, also uh, a monocular depth cue. And so it requires top-down processing. Proximity is also a Gestalt principle. So all of these involve top-down processing. The depth cube blank is caused by the contraction of the ciliary muscles in the eye. All right, so the depth cube of accommodation is when the, uh, the ciliary muscles contract like this. Okay, accommodation is when the ciliary muscles contract to make sure uh, that the lens is focusing onto the fovea. So that is the correct answer, accommodation. Which is the structures re responsible for micro saccades? Micro saccades are based off of the extraocular muscles. These are all inside, and so none of these are involved in micro saccades. All of these are inside of the eyeball, and the extraocular muscles are the ones that cause the jumps that are the micro saccades. A one-eyed pirate can use can use which one of these depth cues? All right. Remember, accommodation is uh, a monocular depth cue. It only requires one eye to do it. So, yep, you could do that. Linear perspective, that's when it looks like the two lines are coming together as the parallel lines are coming together the farther away they get. That's also monocular. Binocular disparity requires two eyes. And if this pirate only has one eye, then it can't use binocular disparity. Motion parallax, that's when things that are closer to you seem like they're going faster than things that are farther away, and that's monocular. Familiar size is also a monocular depth cue, and so all of these that are monocular depth cues a one-eyed pirate can use. Which of the following is a study that demonstrates Schachter and Singer's two-factor theory? All right, Schachter and Singer's two-factor theory are, one, you experience arousal, two, you have a cognitive interpretation, of what that arousal is, and that makes the emotion, all right? So if you remember asking how fast the cars were going when they smashed into each other, that was an example of how bad our eyewitness testimony is, right? And how we can be uh, primed to, to answer things based off of even words like smashed versus bump. Asking men and women to talk over the phone while they had seen an attractive or unattractive photo, that's an example of self-fulfilling prophecy. Right, self-fulfilling prophecy because when the men saw an attractive photo, they treated the woman that way and she uh, became more attractive to outside observers. Paying students $1 or $20 to lie, that is, that is uh, Carl Smith, Festinger and Carl Smith's um, cognitive dissonance study and it has nothing to do with Schachter and Singer's two-factor theory of motion. Men crossing a stable or a scary bridge, ooh, that's the one because when men crossed the scary bridge, they were more attracted to the woman on the other side then when they uh, passed the stable bridge, they were taking the arousal that came from the scary bridge and they were making a cognitive interpretation that it was the woman that was causing that. 
Cortisol works by, well, it doesn't cause depression. It doesn't make people feel high or hallucinate. It does shut down your reproductive system and other systems that are not important when you're running away from a tiger. And it does make energy available in the bloodstream. It does both of those things. Cortisol is associated with stress. And so you should think about it, what happens when you have a uh, fear response or kind of like a fight or flight response. Which of the following stop the production of GABA, which then leads to more dopamine being released? All right, so if you stop GABA, GABA is inhibitory. So if you stop that, then that means the dopamine is more likely to be released naturally by the next cell. Caffeine is a stimulant that doesn't do that. Alcohol doesn't work that way either. Heroin is an opiate, and that's what happens. It stops the GABA and lets dopamine be released. But marijuana also does that. It just does it on a separate way. LSD just mimics serotonin, and that's how it causes its, uh, its effects. Cocaine stops the, the reuptake of dopamine. SSRIs stop the reuptake of serotonin and are helpful in treating things like depression. Gestalt psychologists came, became blank psychologists when they came to the United States. They actually became social psychologists when they came to the United States. They took their ideas of, uh, of perceptual psychology and then made them, um, and then translated those into a social situation, especially as we came towards World War II and they were working for the government to help persuade people. Basic emotions. These are the ones that you are born with and you do not need to learn. So surprise, joy, and sadness. Shame requires you to understand what other people think of you. So you have to have both self-perception, sorry, self-awareness and theory of mind in order to experience it. You're not born with it, so shame is not good. I can test theory of mind by, well, if, I, if you can lie, then you must have a theory of mind. Theory of mind is I have a theory that you have a mind. Understanding that other people have their own point of view and can make judgments about you. The other way to do this is ask a child about what Ann thinks the ball or the basket. The child pushing a shopping cart, that was a self-awareness test. Putting a mark on an animal, that's also a self-awareness test. So these two are theory of mind. If positive charge blanks enter the neuron, a blank potential is more likely to occur. If positively charged ions enter the neuron, an action potential is more likely to occur. In Cantor and Dahl's 1975 study, this is the treadmill and watching the, the sex scene, which group of men did not experience misattribution of arousal? So which ones did not experience that? Those who rested for nine minutes and those who rested for one minute did not experience misattribution of arousal. Those who rested for five minutes did experience misattribution of arousal. So those who rested for one minute, they didn't misattribute their arousal. They knew their arousal was because of the treadmill. Those who rested for nine minutes, they didn't have arousal anymore, so they didn't have anything to misattribute. Those who rested for five minutes, their heart was beating a little bit faster, but they thought it was just because of the sex scene, not because of the treadmill. So if I feel like I'm the only person who gets nervous during exam, in reality, all the students in my class get nervous, and each one thinks that they, uh, they're the only ones who gets nervous, that is a good example of pluralistic ignorance. When I have a belief that I'm different from the, the group, I'm wrong about that, and lots of people share that same belief. Balance theory is when we want to keep our attitudes about objects balanced, right? That's the triangle one. OCD, that is obsessive compulsive disorder. Cognitive dissonance is when you experience imbalance that creates a negative arousal and then you uh, and then you need to resolve that. According to evolutionary theory, parental investment is more important to females. Females should be more concerned about parental investment than males because they're the ones who tend to have to uh, be more invested in the baby and so therefore they're more concerned about the investment in uh, in a mate. That's according to evolutionary theory. Two male chimpanzees fight with each other in order to see which male, which mates with the females. This is an example of intrasexual because intra means within. So intrasexual is within the sex of male, right? Two males within their sex are fighting intrasexual competition. The need to belong is most closely related to 
attachment theory. Remember, attachment theory is the desire to attach with uh, a primary attachment figure so that it can take care of your fears, etc. Um, and that's very similar to the need to belong. Operant conditioning, that's when somebody learns, some organism learns a new behavior based off of reinforcements or punishments. Social comparison theory is when I make a judgment about my own self, my own abilities based off of comparing to other people. And cognitive dissonance, like we said before, is when you experience imbalance, which causes arousal that you need to then resolve. Generally, that is an imbalance between a behavior that you've done and an attitude about yourself. Americans are attracted to thin people. This is best explained by which theory? This is a sociocultural theory because other, um, other cultures do not have attraction to thin people, right? In other cultures, larger people are more attractive. This is a sociocultural theory. Biosocial means evolutionary. Social cognitive means based off of cognitions, that is attitudes, beliefs, goals, etc. Learning theory is behaviorism. Which of the following are consequences of pluralistic ignorance? So, alienation and assimilation. Feeling alienated from the group, feeling separated from the group, that is alienation. Assimilation is trying to uh, do the actual um, norm that isn't correct, that isn't real. A person can really know about how many people? 150. You can know about 150 people after that, you don't really know them. You just have them as Facebook friends and you don't really know what's going on. You don't really follow them. Paul Ekman's research with the people of Papua New Guinea seeks to support a theory of emotion based off of, that's the biosocial theory because biosocial theory is the evolutionary theory. Which of the following are XYZ statements? Okay, so for this one, I need, to, I need something that says, when you did X in situation Y, I felt Z. And it has to be I felt. Can't say it made me. That doesn't, that's not right. So it's got to have all three elements. When you look at me like that, I hate it. Okay, that doesn't say when you looked at me in a specific situation, it's too general. So it's not an XYZ statement. I love it when you give me presents. No, that's not it. When you give me presents, in what situation? Where's the situation? There's no why there. You always eat my ice cream and it makes me mad. There's no I statement. I didn't, there's no I felt anywhere. When you stole my turtle, that's X, yesterday, that's Y, I felt mad, that's Z. When you sat on my iPhone, that's X, this morning, that's Y, I felt disgusted. Those are your XYZ statements. Psychoanalysis would be most associated with, all right, so psychoanalysis is most associated with Freud and his uh, students. Carl Jung was a student of Freud. Kurt Levine did Kurt Levine's field theory, which is a major portion of social psychology. Leon Festinger was important for social comparison theory and cognitive dissonance theory, which is also social psychology. B.F. Skinner was a famous behavioral psychologist. Jung is evolved with psychoanalysis. Freud believed that the blank was part of the subconscious that motivated people to kill other people. All right. So this is either the id, ego, or superego, and it's the id, okay? The id is what wants to do animalistic sexual desires, violent behaviors, et cetera. The superego wants to do whatever the, the culture wants you to do, and your ego balances them out. So the answer is id. What does DSM stand for? Diagnostic and statistical, statistical, manual. This is the list of all the disorders and how to, um, how to diagnose them. Someone who's experiencing GAD has their fear response activated. This means that their blank nervous system is activated. Okay, so generalized anxiety disorder, GAD, can cause basically the fight or flight type response, all right? The fight or flight response is sympathetic. It's sympathetic. Okay, it happens quickly like that. Retroactive is, I don't know, I just made that up. Parasympathetic happens after the sympathetic system, nervous system is, uh, is being used to calm you down. And the somatic nervous system is what you voluntarily control your muscles with. Soma means body, voluntarily control your body. 
Which of the following includes depression as one of its symptoms? So schizophrenia is not necessary to have depression. Bipolar one, one of the poles is depression. Dysthymia, that is persistent depression. Major depression, yep, yeah, that's that's gotta have it. Bipolar two, one of the other poles, one of the poles is depression. Antisocial personality disorder doesn't require depression. Positive and negative symptoms are most associated with schizophrenia. Positive means added symptoms, things like hallucinations, you add that. And negative symptoms means like less of something, like blunted affect, blunted abilities, etc. SSRIs are most similar to blank in the way that they work in the synaptic level. SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They stop the reuptake of serotonin. Cocaine stops the reuptake of dopamine. These other ones don't stop any reuptake. They do, they work in different ways. Which of the following involves multiple personalities? Dissociative identity disorder. None of the other ones involve multiple personalities, only dissociative identity disorder. Which of the following is a study about self-fulfilling prophecy? Snyder and all's study where men see a photo of a woman then talk with the woman on the phone? Yep, that's the one. Because the man's prophecy is fulfilled when the woman responds to the way he acts to, towards her and she becomes uh, objectively more attractive to outside observers. These other ones, Michelle studied that, uh, that was the marshmallow study talking about uh, self-control. Um, so a White et al. study, this is about misattribution of arousal and its polarization. Festinger and Carl Smith study, $1, $20 study, that's about cognitive dissonance. Freud's theory is most closely related to, well, Jung is Freud's, uh, Freud's student, so Jung's theory. Kurt Levine's field theory is most related to which one of these? All right, now remember, Kurt Levine's field theory is that uh, behavior is a function of the personality trait of the person and the social situation they find themselves in. Well, attribution is when you attribute a behavior to either the personality or the situation, an internal or external attribution, so attribution. I ask you to look at a picture where it's not exactly clear what's going on. It's a picture of people sitting at a table. You don't know what the context is. This would be a TAT, thematic apperception task. Rorschach ink blot, you wouldn't be able to tell that it was a person sitting at a table. It is also a test of personality, though, because test of personalities, in, it, this is testing what your personality is. It is also a projective measure. Rorschach is a projective measure, but so is the TAT. So all of these, except for Rorschach. I just got fired because I watched a football game with my friends instead of preparing for my presentation. All right. I watched the football game with my friends instead of preparing for my presentation. What is going on? Well, self-handicapping. Self-handicapping is when you do something that will inhibit your performance so that you can blame it on that instead of on yourself. All right. Okay. So that's an example of self handicapping. Now, I just got fired because I watched instead of preparing for my presentation. Normally, when I'm doing this, though, I'm trying to also use a self serving bias, right? I'm trying to get something external I can blame my failure on. The fundamental attribution error, that's not anything to do with it. Door in the face, no. Self perception theory, no. So those two are correct. If I'm easy to get along with, this is a representation of, these are all part of the big five. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism. All right, those are all of those, okay? If you're easy to get along with, then that is how you are agreeable. That's agreeableness. The other ones don't necessarily have anything to do with uh, being nice. They just have to do with agreeableness. Sharice autokinetic effect study. This is the one where there is the light in a pitch black room. There's only one light and it looks like it's moving around after you stare at it for a while. 
okay? So what's going on with that one? In this particular case, what happened is people came in and they were all together and they looked at this light and the light started to feel like it was moving around, right? When it started to move around, appeared to move around, they asked how far is it moving around? Well, people couldn't actually tell, so they used whatever information they could get, informational influence, right? The influence of other people, they used other people as a source of information, of actual information of what was right and wrong. Which of the following are attitudes? Okay, attitude is an evaluation of an object. So I hate, that's an evaluation, this exam, that's the object. So that's an attitude. I like, that's an evaluation, taking naps. Naps is the object, liking is the evaluation. I am a pessimist, not an evaluation. Okay, this one, I didn't answer, put one in there, so that's not right. I am an optimist, that's also not an attitude. I didn't give one there, so that's not an issue. I don't give up on problems, it's not an evaluation of any particular thing. I love Cheetos, that is an evaluation. Love is evaluation, Cheetos is the object. An attitude has to be an evaluation of an object. White men can't jump is an example of, okay, so now this is a belief about people, right? It's not necessarily how I feel about them or anything else, okay? I'm not necessarily behaving differently. So I'm, it can't be discrimination because I'm not actually behaving. Discrimination has to do with behavior. A stereotype, yep, if I think that this group, white men, can't jump, then that's a stereotype. Is it a belief? Yeah, I believe that white men can't jump. Yeah, that's a belief. Is it prejudice? Do I feel differently because of white men because they can't jump? Not necessarily, no. Is it a cognition? Yes, because it's a belief, it's a cognition, right? Is it an attitude? Well, it's, does it evaluate the object? And the answer is no. It doesn't evaluate the object. It doesn't say I like them or dislike them. It just says they can't jump. What percentage of the females in Sheridan King's 1972 study about shocking puppies actually shocked the puppies. Now, for you to remember this, this was from our um, our presentation, so I'll even show it to you so you can see what it looks like um, so we can remember. Actually, the easiest way to see this might be just through the video itself. So let me show you on my videos which one it was. This would have been, uh, this would have been chapter 10, part 2, which I believe is this one. What we're going to do is let's open it up and we'll show you what part we're talking about. Oh, it's actually part one, part one that we wanted. So let's go back and find part one. Let's go back and find part one, because that would be the right answer. Chapter 10, part one. There it is. Chapter 10. Part one, it was at the very end, we talked about them shocking the puppy, and then we made the distinction between males and females here. Here it is. Moving ahead. 100% shocked the puppy, 100% of the females, shocked all of the puppies. Okay. 100%. Children in which stage do not understand conservation of volume? Well, we know that in the sensory motor stage, they do not understand the conservation of volume. And generally, 
in the uh, pre-operational stage, they also do not understand conservation. I don't know if I'm a good at skateboarding. How am I gonna find out? Well, the only way I'm gonna find out is really through social comparison theory. I compare myself to other people and that's how I find out. Cognitive dissonance starts with imbalance. So the balance theory is the start of it. And then when you create imbalance, that creates arousal and you need to, you need to separate that out. Dr. Curtis writes difficult exams because he's cruel. This is an example of, so what's going on is my behavior is writing difficult exams. Being, because he's cruel, this is, this would be a personal disposition. You're saying that I am cruel, right? That would be an internal attribution. It's not self-serving because it's not about you. You're not interpreting uh, something about yourself. The fundamental attribution error says that people make, um, other people do things because of internal uh, issues, right? It's not an attitude because you're not saying that I'm good or bad. Uh, you're just saying that I did something because I'm cruel and that's internal and the FAE. Freeman and Frazier's study where they asked participants to put a sign up in the yard was an example of, in this particular case, it is put in the door. What they tried to do is they said, hey, would you, would you mind putting uh, this in your window versus putting a sign in your yard. Oh, I'm sorry, this sign in the yard, they asked to put a sign in the yard versus, uh, versus, the, um, uh, versus the signature versus something small. So that's door in the face, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. This is door in the face, not foot in the door, I apologize. Children experiencing an edible complex, <sighs> they're in the phallic stage. They're in the phallic stage of um, uh, of uh, Freud's psychosexual stages. How many manipulations are there in this strange situation? A manipulation is when you actually go in and change something. The strange situation is not an experiment. There are zero manipulations. There's only measurement, zero. In the marshmallow study, children are measured to see if they'll eat a marshmallow. Then they grow and they're measured to see how well they adjusted they are, how many operationalizations have I mentioned in this description. Measured to see how they eat a marshmallow, that's an operationalization. They're measured to see how well adjusted they are, that's two operationalizations. Every measurement and every manipulation is an operationalization. Children in Kohlberg's conventional stage would have the hardest time experiencing which of the following emotions. All right, so in the conventional stage, uh, okay, so in this particular case, it'd be hardest for them to probably do embarrassment because you're born with all of these other ones, right? So you're born with these, you have to learn other stuff. So uh, these are easy to do. The hardest part would probably be embarrassment. The zone of proximal development Oh man, <laughs> the zone of proximal development is a Vygotsky theory, part of Vygotsky's theory. So you'd have to look that one up. Yep, Vygotsky. In reproduction of the Milgram study, Milgram changed several variables to see how they would affect obedience, which of the following resulted in less obedience than the original study. So the participant obeying less, obeying the researcher less. If a, a dissenting authority happened, boy, that really made it go down. A consenting peer, a consenting peer means the peer want, keeps going and says yes to the researcher. So that, that created more, not less. When the learner is in the same room as the teacher, remember the learner is the person receiving the shocks. Yep, that came up with less. Dissenting peer, that is the peer, another person you think is a participant says, hey, I'm not gonna do this. That also ended up with less obedience. I want to buy a car, so I ask you to buy my house first. I'm trying to use the door in the face technique. Okay? I'm trying to use the door in the face technique because I want you to say no so that you'll say yes to a smaller request. Object permanence happens in the sensory motor stage. The sensory motor stage. Michelle's marshmallow study uses a 
this is a longitudinal. Longitudinal has nothing to do with whether it's an experiment or correlational. It is longitudinal. It's the same people at one point and then at a separate point. It's longitudinal. So it's not cross-sectional. That would mean just you know half compared to half. It's the same people over time, longitudinal. Harlow's monkey study was meant to contrast the learning theory. Remember, learning theory is behaviorism that was going on really a lot at the time. I want you to tell your mother you love her. I give you a grade every third time you tell your mother you love her. Okay, so the actual behavior of saying I love you is what's being reinforced. All right. So first of all, is that fixed or is it variable? Well, it's every third time, every third time. So that's fixed. Is it interval? Is it based off of like actual time, like minutes? Nope. Is it ratio? Yeah, it's based off of the number of instances of doing something. So it is a fixed ratio reinforcement schedule. Which of the following treatment styles is most likely to help you understand if your attributions are reasonable? So cognitive behavioral therapy has to do with your cognitions and their behavior, right? So cognitive behavioral therapy would look at the way you make judgments like attributions and see whether or not they're reasonable. Which of the following is true about self-handicapping? It allows me, self-perception theory is when I look at my own behavior to figure out my own attitude. So this has nothing to do with self-perception. So this is not right and that's not right, but it does allow me to use the self-serving bias when I fail. And it also uses, lets me use the self-serving bias when I succeed, because the self-serving bias is I make an internal attribution when good things happen to me. I make an external when bad things do. So self-handicapping, if I fail, then I can say, oh, it's because, you know, my roommates made me go out last night. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. But if I succeed, then I must be a super genius because I succeeded even though my roommates made me go out last night. If I believe that Jane was born a genius and will always be a genius, which of the following is going to be true? Well, that's not an external situational attribution. And it's not growth mindset. It's fixed, right? She's a genius. She'll always be a genius. And that is her internal or dispositional trait. So the attribution I'm making is also internal. All right, that's the end. Thanks, everybody.